I really didn't know how music was made. In fact, when I started on the tour, I brought my tennis racket with me. And I was thinking that as we went from city to city, I was going to take a tennis lesson. You know? Everyone was like looking at me like I was totally nuts. Of course, you know, nights turned into uh, days, and uh, you know, I was never seen in the daytime again. Sort of, it turned to a vampire. She was so bored after a while of photographing the Rolling Stones. You know, there's only so much she can do. And um, I think that's what drove her to feminism. But anyway, uh, she said, I keep looking at you guys' cocks all the time. I just keep looking at your cocks. But uh, she, uh, when she'd finished doing that, she used to photograph the, the audience. And I think there's a some good pictures of that period when she does all these audience snaps, which in some ways are just as interesting, if not more so, than the band. I became very interested in the audience. I would spend a lot of time wandering through the audience and looking at the audience. And I would watch people sort of give themselves up. I didn't see the photograph as adulation. I actually saw it as desperation. People sort of smashed against a chain link fence. It was very poetic. You know, um, but it looked very painful to me. It's very difficult to photograph music. It's, it's something in the air. But you can uh, photograph the energy and, you know, what it takes. You know, I don't think anyone realizes the kind of strain one is on when they're on stage. I like to call it my Francis Bacon, you know, because it has a very gory quality to it. In a certain way, I was trying to show uh, that, that life on the road was not glamorous, you know, that the idea of propelling one's body through space a lot faster than it's meant to go um, took its toll. And their lifestyle, you know, it was a very hard lifestyle. And, um, you know, I was trying to, to show, uh, to try to de-romanticize it, you know, to, to, to show a side that was not so pretty. This is a photograph taken of Keith Richards, actually done for the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. Keith Richards was in Toronto uh, for a drug charge, and he was waiting to go to court. And this is the, the portable studio that I set up in his hotel room. It's a good example of, you know, my crude lighting. Um, He's taking a little break in between the, the photo shooting. It wasn't very work orientated, uh, and there was a lot of um, sort of hanging out, and sort of taking drugs and so on, all that sort of thing. More so, perhaps, in the 60s, or just different drugs from the 60s. So it was that area. And yeah, I think that, that, that Annie did a lot of pictures that um, remember that or reflect that when you look at them. I think she was very um, aware of all that. Oh, she was very much part of it. Um, she was a sort of hands-on. She wasn't like a f so much as a fly in the wall as kind of a, one of the guys, you know, taking part in everything. She liked to be one of the guys. You know, I basically gave myself up to whatever was going on and felt that that was what one did as a, as a, um, as a journalist or as a, uh, you know, in that kind of reportage work that in order to get the best work, you had to sort of totally be involved. And um, people talk about the soul of the sitter, but there's also the the soul of the photographer. And, you know, I basically almost lost, you know, my soul. I mean, it wasn't the Rolling Stones' fault, you know. It was, it was my fault for allowing myself, to, you know, to give myself up, you know, to go, to go in something so deeply that, you know, I let it, you know, overtake me.
you know, a wonderful way to be a photographer is, is to watch life unfold in front of you. But it got to be that I would walk into a room, and after this is after you know four or five years, three or four, five years working for Rolling Stone, and it, and my subject, who would be who's supposed to be really in my frame, is suddenly walking up to me, and my frame is you know getting in, and and saying, oh hi, Annie, how are you? What's going on? And it and it, and the dynamics have changed. I can no longer be um, you know just sort of invisible. I mean, suddenly your subject was sort of, not only was he, you know, sitting there talking to you, you know, and not being involved in his life so that you could just photograph whatever was going on, you know, he was suddenly saying, what do you want me to do? You know, and that sort of, uh, I don't know, what do you, I mean, what, what are you doing? Or, you know, I mean, it's, and, um, you know, I think that I became more comfortable with something that sort of said this was posed and this is set up. She was doing some kind of seduction. There was something about her personality that was so strong and, and compelling that people would do things for her that they wouldn't do for other photographers. So Rolling Stone had pictures that no one else had. And that was something that, that the combination of her and her proximity to these people getting these pictures in the magazine became a kind of cycle so that more and more she was the star, the, she, the picture was the, the, the kind of performance. I started to think of ways to make the cover portrait something more than just um, a face looking out at you. I, I liked when, when photographs um, even the post pictures told you a little story or gave you a little more information. That's when I did Steve Martin against the Franz Klein painting, Bette Midler and the Roses, um, you know, Clint Eastwood, you know, tied up. to the emergency room of the Roosevelt site, St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital, this evening, shortly before 11 p.m. He was dead on arrival. And I guess was their last, you know, official photo session. And, you know, by, you know, that kind of horrible, horrible accident of fate, uh, you know, within hours, he was murdered. You know, in retrospect, that picture looks, you know, like a return to the womb, you know, preparation for death. Uh, so, you know, it's got, it, uh, it's got tremendous resonance and, uh, you know, it's evocative of a really powerful emotional time. It's a very powerful picture, a very powerful image, and, and it's certainly one of the, you know, Annie's great classics. What was unusual is, is I imagined both of them nude together, and at the last minute, Yoko didn't want to take her clothes off. She said she was willing to take her shirt off, but not her pants, and I was really disappointed, and she just said, oh, we'll just leave everything on. And of course, it, it was a much stronger to see John nude and very vulnerable. When we shot the first Polaroid, and, and, I, and I peeled it, and he looked at it, he was very, very excited. You know, he said, you know, this is our relationship. Once John died, I mean, no question that we were gonna use it, and then went further and decided it just didn't need any headlines at all. So it was the one issue of Rolling Stone ever that we put out that had no type on the cover, except the logo. Despite her continuing professional success throughout the late 70s, her drug addiction was becoming increasingly debilitating. Those times were a little crazy. I mean, it was the peak of the drug times, and um, pretty much everybody we were covering and everybody we were working with was taking drugs, you know, in one form or another. And, you know, it just got, you know, kind of crazier and crazier, and Annie got into it perhaps a little heavier than most. Um, and after a while, it sort of just kind of took over and started managing her and her managing the drugs. And um, uh, it led to some pretty rough times. There is this myth that you have to be in a lot of pain, you know, to be working, and, and I, I think I certainly fell into that, that category of thinking that... Uh, um, it, it did make it, in a certain way, you know, easier to work because you really didn't have to have a life, you know. Um, it took care of, 
any other needs, you know, that, that you had. You know, finally came to a place it was just best for us to kind of part ways at the end and, and get her out of the milieu that might have encouraged her to take drugs and also get um, uh, our operations back on a more even keel and, you know, and get off that roller coaster that Andy had become. It took me years to, to come back to myself. Yeah. You know, and, and you're not yourself. You're a little bit more uh, battle-worn. But, uh, you know, no, amazingly enough, uh, I, I did continue to work, you know. Uh, I'm, I think it's, it's what really saved me. Right, um, do you want to get together a little bit before the Twilight Art meeting just to discuss what, you know, I'm going to discuss and... Yes, I'll be in the studio. In 1981, Annie Leibovitch joined the newly relaunched Vanity Fair. The magazine was in the ascendance and rapidly becoming the magazine of the 80s. A generation of Rolling Stone readers had come of age and they now had money and power. Hi, Bernice. Hi, how are you? Okay. Before she came to Vanity Fair, she was beginning to be somewhat pigeonholed as a kind of cult photographer of rock and roll burnout case. And when she joined Vanity Fair, that was really the image of her that people had, that she was the person who was there at the very last minute of a Stones tour when everybody was strung out, and then she'd get her fantastic shot. What she's been able to do since joining Vanity Fair is really grow and evolve and develop as a photographer in terms of her subject matter as much as her technique. So that now you'll see Annie doing a portfolio like her Watergate portfolio, where she went back and photographed all the protagonists of Watergate or the Hall of Fame, which she does every Christmas, in which she will do anybody from Havel to the head of uh, Fox Studio. Uh, it's not just simply performers. It's not just rock and roll. She really has a much, much wider spectrum to do. Many memorable images.